Che, no somos ni diez. Hijos de puta que son, boluda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pico Electrodynamics seminar series. Uh, I am Satvik. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Purdue University. Uh, so the aim of this Pico Electrodynamic Theory Network is to uh, bring together theorists working on the density functional theory, quantum many body physics, electrodynamics, quantum optics, and really looking into the Pico scale fluctuations in deep inside the matter related to the electromagnetic fields. So in, as a part of this theory network, we are bringing in theorists and also some of the experimentalists working in this area to really uh, develop the collaboration across the uh, across many of these fields so that the, we can push forward this uh, new whole field of the Pico electrodynamics. So uh, with this, uh, we, in the last week, uh, in the last time, we had a talk by the Professor John Saib from the University of Toronto. And with that, we kick-started this network. As a second talk, we, we have a Professor uh, Joseph Mechikio from the University of Alberta, and now Professor Jubin Jacob will introduce him. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Satwik. Um, it is, um, my pleasure to welcome you all to the talk and also a very special pleasure to invite uh, a friend, um, Professor Joseph Machieko from the University of Alberta Physics Department. I have known him for many years and we are eagerly looking forward to his talk. I uh, want to mention just a little bit about the long list of achievements that he has. I want to mention that um, Professor Machieko is the Canada Research Chair in Condensed Matter Theory. And he is also the director of the Theoretical Physics Institute at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, he received his PhD from Stanford in 2011, and he has a string of awards uh, from the Faculty of Science, the, also the Faculty of Graduate Studies at University of Alberta, all related to his research and mentorship of um, the, the next generation of physicists. I should mention that uh, he, uh, works on a very wide range of theory problems. And uh, what is very unique about his insight is that um, Joseph is able to connect between uh, very different areas of uh, high energy physics, uh, condensed matter physics, as well as um, kind of inspired from uh, fundamental mathematics that allows um, completely new insights into physical problems. So with that uh, short introduction, um, I would like to um, kind of give the floor to Joseph, and I eagerly look forward to listening from him to, from him about uh, hyperbolic lattices. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Zupin for this very kind introduction, and also for this invitation to speak at this uh, very nice seminar series. So let me begin by uh, sharing my slides. Okay, very good. So, um, so we'll get started. So today we'll be uh, talking about uh, sort of uh, potentially a new chapter in uh, the band theory of, of certain class of materials. So let's start with the basics. So in uh, kinetic matter physics, we're interested in a wide variety of materials and classes of materials. For example, we have uh, semi-metals, insulators, and semiconductors, semi-metals like graphene here. We're interested in magnets, superconductors. So these are all solid state materials, but we're also interested in uh, synthetic materials, for example, we can have photonic lattices, we can have optical lattices, and so on. So despite the great variety of materials, uh, maybe something you can glean from this picture is that one thing they have in common is that in many cases they are periodic. Okay, so they are crystalline uh, materials or metamaterials. So what do we really mean by periodic? So let's just uh, step back a bit because we know that there's other types of materials that are ordered, but they're not necessarily periodic. For example, if you have a quasi-crystal, it's an aperiodic structure. It is certainly ordered, but it doesn't have periodicity. So the difference is that a material that is periodic is something that has translation symmetry. So a quasi-crystal will have rotational symmetry, but it doesn't have translation symmetry. So when we say translation symmetry, it means that the system goes back to itself after a shift or a uh, translation. So um, we'll be sticking with uh, two dimensions uh, for this talk. And we can ask what are the possible uh, periodic uh, structures or crystalline lattices in two dimensions. So in fact, in this talk, I'll use the words lattice or tiling or tessellation uh, interchangeably. They all mean periodic lattice. And uh, we can basically just use simple uh, Euclidean geometry to determine how many uh, such lattices there are. There's two conditions. So we're going to be focused here on uh, what we call regular lattices, which are kind of tilings of the plane by regular polygons. So polygons that have uh, the same number, um, 
uh, same side lengths and same interior angles. So the two conditions are that in, in Euclidean geometry, the sum of the interior angles of a polygon with P sides is P minus two times pi. For example, for a triangle, the sum will be pi. And also at each vertex of this uh, lattice, the sum of all the angles around the lattice has to be equal to two pi. So if you put uh, these uh, two conditions together, uh, you will get this equation where here I'm using this uh, so-called Schlafly notation, which is a, a pair of integers. P denotes the number of sides of the polygon and Q denotes the, uh, the coordination number of the vertex. So namely, how many polygons will fit, uh, will touch at each vertex of the lattice. And so if you solve this equation, there's only three solutions, which are the three uh, well-known lattices in, in flat space, which are the triangular lattice, the honeycomb lattice, and the square lattice. So lattices exist in flat space, but also the, uh, exist in curved space. Uh, actually, let, before we get there, let me go back and say that, um, so we're interested, of course, not just in the geometry, but we're interested in the physics of lattices. And that means we will have particles uh, hopping on this lattice, and we'll be interested in particles that hop coherently. So either uh, quantum particles or maybe waves in some uh, a classical wave, but that propagates coherently through the lattice. And so the waves that exist on a lattice are block waves. So there's a very nice result called the block theorem that we study in, uh, in kind of matter physics. And essentially tells you that the, the wave function uh, can be found in this way uh, by basically solving the Schrodinger equation within one unit cell, but with the, uh, these kind of boundary condition where the wave function picks up a phase uh, of either e to the ikx, if you translate by one unit in the x direction, or e to the iky, if you translate by one unit in the y direction, and this kx and ky are called the components of the crystal momentum. And uh, if you calculate the uh, energy for each of these values of kx and ky by solving the Schrodinger equation, then you get what is called the band structure of the, of the system, which tells you the, how, how the energy varies with this uh, crystal momentum. Okay, so there's one perspective on this that will be useful uh, for later in the talk, which is that there's another way that we can uh, interpret these kx and ky components of the crystal momentum. So um, what we can do is we can glue together mathematically the uh, edges of this uh, unit cell that are related by a translation. Okay, so if we glue together this left side and this right side, we will get a cylinder topologically. And if we glue this, uh, the bottom side and the top side that are related by this uh, TY translation, then we get a torus. And now if you imagine that you're a particle and you're crossing this unit cell along this uh, translation arrow here, then on this, uh, this torus that I'll call the compactified unit cell, you're uh, going around the lattice uh, in a closed loop. And now you know that you're going to pick up a phase because that is what the block condition is telling you. And so we can think of this phase as some kind of Aaron and Bohm phase or Berry phase that is picked up by the particle as it encloses a flux that is threading this uh, torus. Okay, so I'll view this Kx as a flux that is threading this, uh, this donut, this torus. And then the Ty direction is the same. So then I'm going to go around this other handle of the torus and then I'll be picking up a bare phase that can be ascribed to a flux KY that is threading the torus and the other direction. Again, the, and then so we can view this energy as a plot of how the energy depends on these kind of fictitious magnetic fluxes that are threading this compact of a unit cell. Okay, so now coming back to our, our tilings, our lattices. So I said that uh, we can have uh, these three tilings in flat space, but tilings also exist in curved space. So we'll look at the simplest possible curve space, which is, which is a sphere, which has uniform positive curvature. Uh, and so in that case, the, remember that there's these two conditions from Euclidean geometry. So we had the condition of the sum of the angles around the vertex. So that remains the same because this is a local condition. Uh, but there's another condition, which is the sum of the angles of the, of the polygon. But now in, in curve space, in, uh, in spherical geometry, the sum of these angles is strictly greater than its value in flat space. Okay, for example, if you can have a triangle with three right angles on the sphere, so the sum would be three pi over two, which is strictly greater than, than pi. So as a result, the condition now becomes uh, an inequality. And uh, again, you can solve this inequality and there's five solutions. And these solutions correspond in fact to the platonic solids. Okay, so the spherical versions of the, the platonic solids. So they're lattices, but they're not, uh, they're different from in flat space in the sense that they only have 
finitely many unit cells. So it's not really an infinite or extended timing. And finally, we can look at the other type of, uh, of geometry, which is the so-called hyperbolic plane. Okay, so the so flat space had uniform uh, zero curvature, the sphere has uniform positive curvature, and the hyperbolic plane is a space in two dimensions that has uniform negative curvature. So that space is a bit harder to visualize because there's actually a theorem called Hilbert's theorem that tells you that you cannot embed this space in, in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, we cannot directly realize it in 3D, but if we could, um, it would look like a saddle at every point. Okay, and in particular, what this means is that the in this hyperbolic geometry, the sum of the angles of a, of a polygon will this time be strictly less than its value in flat space. Okay, if you will, these, these polygons are kind of pointier in uh, hyperbolic space. And as a result, again, we get an inequality, but the sign of the inequality is flipped. And now you see that there's infinitely many solutions uh, to this inequality. Okay, so in fact, uh, there's infinitely many tilings in hyperbolic space. So if you will, the crystallography of hyperbolic space is infinitely richer than that of, of Euclidean space. And furthermore, the tilings now are really extended tilings like in flat space. Okay, and so what's interesting is that now you can get tilings that are completely impossible in flat space. So for example, you can have something like a honeycomb lattice, but now there's going to be a coordination four instead of coordination three, which again is not possible in flat space. You can have a hyperbolic version of, of uh, a triangular tiling with, with a seven-fold symmetry, which is quite interesting. And we can also have tilings with polygons with more than six sides. Okay, for example, a tiling by uh, octagons. So in these pictures, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, uh, the, all the, the unit cells look different. They look distorted, right? As we go near the boundary, they look smaller. But actually, if we account for the correct metric of the space with this negative curvature, then actually all these unit cells have exactly the same area. They're really exactly the same. So the structure is really periodic, but in, uh, in the sense of non-Euclidean geometry. Okay, so why should we care about this? This is all uh, pure mathematics so far, but it turns out that um, in fact, these uh, structures have been uh, realized at least approximately in the laboratory. So there was a very nice experiment by Alicia Kolar and collaborator uh, in Princeton um, and that was published in Nature back in 2019 where they fabricate this kind of uh, uh, circuit QED type structure. So it's a network of microwave resonators. So each of these little wiggly lines is a resonator that can trap one photon. And then you have photons that are hopping and non attracting photons that are hopping on this structure. And the structure you can view as a, a finite piece of something that would be a, an infinite hyperbolic lattice. Okay, so in this case, the particular uh, geometry makes it into a hyperbolic Kagome lattice, which is a sort of uh, curved space version of the usual Kagome lattice, which is a network of, of uh, corner sharing triangles, where you have triangles and hexagons usually, but now you have heptagons, okay, which again is, is not possible in Euclidean space. Um, then a bit more recently, there was a, a realization, this time using classical electrical circuits uh, of a hyperbolic version of the triangular lattice with sevenfold symmetry. And now this is a network of capacitors. And the basic idea is that the, the spectrum of resonances of this classical, this classical circuit will, be, will exactly match the eigenenergies of a tight binding uh, quantum Hamiltonian on this lattice. And so you can view this as a kind of classical simulator of the, of the quantum problem. And the observed uh, signatures of coherent wave propagation in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, and then even more recently, so this was published earlier this year, uh, another classical electrical circuit uh, realization of a, this time a hyperbolic version of the honeycomb lattice, the one that I showed earlier. Okay, so in all these cases, we'd like to understand, uh, like we did for ordinary lattices, the spectrum uh, and uh, eigenfunctions of uh, particles that are propagating on these lattices. So in flat space, uh, we know how to do this. So of course, we can just do brute force diagonalization in real space, but it's much more interesting and, and convenient to work in momentum space and compute the best structure relying on Bloch's theorem. And now for these hyperbolic tilings, we can do real space diagonalization, but it's not even clear how we would approach a problem from a momentum space point of view. So how do you even define a crystal momentum? Is there a Bloch theorem? And so on. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I would like to argue that there's in fact a very natural way of uh, defining a crystal momentum for these lattices and constructing block eigenstates, uh, and even in some cases arriving at a block theorem. Okay, so before we get there, let's, uh, I need to introduce a few notions of 
of geometry that will be helpful to understand the, the construction. So I've been showing you these pictures, these disks with you know these, these kind of uh, tilings, but I haven't really explained what these uh, disks mean. So like I said earlier, we cannot directly work with the hyperbolic plane in, in R3. We need to use these, these mathematical models of hyperbolic geometry. And the model that I'm using here is the so-called Poincaré disk model. So the basic idea is that we work with the, uh, the unit disk in the complex plane, but instead of putting the, the flat Euclidean metric on it, we're going to work with this so-called the Poincaré metric, which is the Euclidean metric divided by a factor. And uh, so this uh, scale factor, it kind of blows up as you go near the boundary of the disk. Okay, so in fact, if you were to integrate the area of this disk under that metric, you would see that it, it goes to infinity. Okay, so it's really an infinite space that is kind of represented in some finite disk using this uh, description. So this space is a homogeneous space. So that means that it has uh, a uniformity, it has sort of full translational and rotational symmetry. But in hyperbolic space, this takes the form of invariance under uh, Mobius transformations that are also known as conformal transformations. So these are transformations that preserve the angles like any Euclidean transformation, but they do not preserve the Euclidean distance. Okay, for example, if I take these two points here and I apply to them the same uh, Mobius transformation, they will end up here. And so clearly from a Euclidean uh, point of view, they are, these blue points are further apart than the red points. But if you calculate the, uh, this uh, hyperbolic distance or geodesic distance between these two points, then it's exactly the same. Okay, and in fact, the analog of straight lines in this hyperbolic uh, space are geodesics, and they're going to be uh, these arcs of circle normal to the boundary. And if you calculate the distance along this geodesic with the right metric, then you will see it's really the same. And so that's why all these nearest neighbor distances are exactly the same actually in the, under this metric. And so in the experiment, what they do is that they will have the same strength of coupling between uh, these uh, sites on the graph. And that's why they can emulate the geometry of hyperbolic space, even though of course we cannot realize directly hyperbolic space in, in three dimensions. Okay, so we have these uh, mathematical descriptions of, of this space. And uh, to develop a block theory, we need to understand something like discrete translations or lattice translations on this lattice. Okay, so here I'll be focused on this octagonal lattice. And so uh, we want something that will translate from one unit cell to the next. Okay, so for example, this left unit cell here to the unit cell on the right. And um, we might think that because we're in two dimensions, there will be something like two basis vectors or two uh, elementary translations that can generate the whole group of translations. But actually because of the curvature, there's going to be in this case, uh, four elementary generators. And in general, there will always be more than two generators in hyperbolic space. Okay, so these generators, if I combine them all, if I multiply them, then I will tile the entire uh, structure. And this group of translations actually is not a billion in, in this case. And um, it, it is, has this form, it's generated by these four translations and it's, uh, it, these translations need to satisfy this relation. So how can I understand this relation? Again, let's proceed by analogy with flat space. So in flat space, let's say for this square lattice, remember that, that I had this picture of a compact fat unit cell. And now if you look at these uh, arrows here and you draw them on the compact fat unit cell, then as I said earlier, there will become closed loops. And um, now this relation here, we can view it from two points of view. So on the translation side, it just means that translations don't, uh, that translations commute with each other, which is something we know in flat space. And on the, the torus side, this relation means that if you, if you compose these loops, for example, if you go around the blue loop once and then the red loop once, and then you go along the blue loop in the opposite order and the red loop in the opposite order, you will get a curve that can contract to a point on this torus. Okay, and that is what is meant by unity. So it's a topological representation of the algebra of translation operators in uh, the extended space. So the same thing happens uh, for this octagonal uh, tiling in, in hyperbolic space. So if I uh, think about these arrows as loops on the compactified surface, they will obey this kind of loop algebra of composition of loops. So this will be the fundamental group of this uh, surface with two holes in topology. And then in the extended uh, lattice, this means uh, that this is the algebra that these translation operators must obey. All right, so now maybe you can see where I'm going. So remember that in this uh, translational, uh, in this uh, square lattice, I had this picture of a compact fed unit cell as a torus. And then these block phases where 
Berry phases or Aronenbaum phases picked up by the electron as it goes around the cycles of this uh, torus. Now in this hyperbolic lattice, the, the surface has two holes. So now there's four possible uh, loops on this surface. And so that means that I can naturally define four components of crystal momentum, which are going to be the kind of magnetic fluxes threading these, these cycles. And the reason that I can do that is that I can actually explicitly construct a class of wave functions that will solve the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I will define a wave function as uh, a solution of this Schrodinger equation on the unit cell, but subject to these kind of twisted boundary condition, okay, such that I will pick up a phase of EDVIKJ for each translation along direction gamma J. And since there's four of them, there's going to be four distinct components of this crystal momentum. Again, so you can, and can substitute this kind of block onsatz into the Schrodinger equation, solve it, and you will obtain uh, a band structure that you can plot. So what's interesting here is that even though the real space is uh, of course still two dimensional, momentum space now becomes a higher dimensional torus. Okay, so the Brillouin zone now actually becomes a four or in fact, even can be a six or, or, or a higher dimensional object depending on the geometry of the lattice. Okay, so, uh, so that's kind of where I'm going. So the, the basic idea is that we will define this, uh, this uh, translation group that uh, corresponds to a given unit cell. And in fact, that allows us to, to uh, describe the whole class of lattices, not only a single lattice, understanding that there is a concept of Bravais lattice. Okay, so Bravais lattice, in crystallography is a lattice that has this uh, translation invariance. And we know that not all lattices are Bravais lattices, but we can, we can describe them as a Bravais lattice with a basis. For example, graphene is a honeycomb lattice and it's not itself a Bravais lattice, but you can view it as a triangular Bravais lattice with two sites per unit cell. So likewise here, for example, this 8,3 lattice, uh, I can view it as an 8,8 lattice with uh, a 16 uh, basis sites, which are these red dots here. And so what this means is that I can construct a block Hamiltonian that will live in a four dimensional momentum space because of this compactification here with two holes, but with uh, 16 bands. Okay, so the band structure would have uh, 16 bands dispersing in four dimensional momentum space. But as I just mentioned earlier, this uh, dimensional momentum space actually depends on the, uh, the type of lattice I have, which again, is quite different from the Euclidean case. So for example, we can show that this uh, heptagonal tiling now we can view it as a Bravais lattice with a 14-sided uh, unit cell um, and uh, with 56 uh, sites within this 14-sided unit cell. And the 14-sided unit cell, again, we can show that it compactifies onto a genus three surface. So now momentum space becomes six-dimensional and there will be uh, 56 bands in this description. Okay, so that's a few examples, but we can make this uh, more general. Okay, so uh, so far there's two issues that I've, I've sort of uh, swept under the rug. Okay, so one is that I've, I've explained that I can construct an infinite family of, of eigenstates of the block form, but I haven't shown that it's a complete set. Okay, so we have an ansatz, but we don't yet have a theorem. And the, the second question is, well, in experiment, of course, we cannot realize an infinite lattice. These are synthetic systems. So uh, whether this uh, block theory can help us understand finite lattices. Uh, so in fact, uh, to address both issues simultaneously, we'll proceed exactly in the same way as we do when we do basic uh, you know, solid state physics and we learn about the block theorem, we impose periodic boundary conditions. The wave vector becomes discretized. Then we can count exactly how many states we have and make sure that we have account for all the states in the spectrum. And also this allows us to, to describe finite systems, but we can make them arbitrarily large. Okay, so it's a very general way of proceeding. So before I can do directly to the hyperbolic space, Imposing periodic boundary conditions is, is not intuitive because of the complicated geometry. So let's review how we do this in, in flat space first. So let's begin with a very simple example, which is just a one dimensional chain. Um, and so what we do is we impose a periodic boundary conditions on a chain with n sites. So I demand that the wave function goes back to itself after a translation by n units. And so, so topologically this amounts to kind of gluing together these uh, n sites into a circle and we know that the wave vector becomes discretized now, and there's n linearly independent block states for these n values of, of the momentum. And since we had n sites in our system, the Hilbert space is n-dimensional and we've accounted for all the states. Okay, so we're assured that this uh, set of block states is a complete set for the problem. So uh, to transpose this, these ideas to the hyperbolic case, I need to view this from a group theory point of view. Okay, so we won't go into the details of group theory, but the basic idea is that in quantum mechanics, 
quantum numbers, for example, uh, the uh, crystal momentum correspond to irreducible representations of the symmetry group. For example, if we have the rotation group, then we know that the angular momentum is the, the label that tells you what are the representation of that group, and it tells you how to label your quantum states in your spectrum. Okay, here, of course, uh, we need to look at momentum, which is uh, which labels the representations of the relevant translation groups. So what are these translation groups? Well, for the infinite lattice, it's just a group Z of translations by one unit, it's an infinite group. And when we compactify this, uh, this uh, lattice, then what this amounts to doing is choosing a subgroup of, uh, of this group G that I call GPBC, which is a group of translations by uh, multiples of N under which I demand that the wave function remain invariant. Okay? And then if I take the quotient of these two groups, I get this finite group Zn, which is a group of translations modulo N, okay? which is a group of translations that I have left on my finite uh, structure. And then if I investigate the the reps of that group, they're going to be uh, exactly these, uh, their roots of unity, they give me the block phases corresponding to this discrete k vector. Okay, so if I can enumerate all the reps of that group, then I can uh, uh, de determine all the quantum numbers and make sure that my spectrum is complete. So, uh, so now we can transpose this kind of group theory idea to the hyperbolic problem. So we start from the infinite lattice that has this uh, transition group gamma, that's not a billion. And then to define periodic bound recognitions, I will choose a subgroup of that group that I'll call gamma PBC. And then I will demand that the wave function remains invariant under the action of that group. Okay. And if I do that correctly, then I will get a, uh, a, a patch of hyperbolic lattice with, uh, without boundaries, a closed patch of it. And furthermore, that has n unit cells of my kind of Bravais lattice structure. And then if I form the quotient gamma mod gamma PBC, and I look at its irreducible representations, then I can, first of all, they were going to be block states and I can make sure that I can count them to, uh, to make sure that I have the full, the full spectrum. Okay, so the only uh, tricky bit is that actually enumerating, enumerating these subgroups is actually not a, a, a simple problem. So in flat space, it's easy. You just make a circle that's bigger and bigger, or if it was a, a patch of square lattice, you just get a torus that's bigger and bigger. Here, because of the fact that the boundary in hyperbolic space grows very rapidly, uh, it becomes kind of very ragged. Um, there's many different ways of gluing these boundary components together. And so that means that there's many, many different ways of compactifying your patch of lattice into a closed surface. Again, in fact, so we can't do this by hand, but we can do this uh, computationally using sort of group theory uh, uh, computer routines. And what we see is that the number of these possible ways of defining boundary conditions, periodic boundary condition grows nearly exponentially with the system size. Again, we can do this for this hexagonal tiling and also for this, this hexagonal tiling. But any of them will define a valid sort of choice of the periodic boundary conditions. So having defined these periodic boundary conditions, we can form this uh, group of translation, this quotient that tells us how we translation act on our finite piece of lattice. Um, and then we can work out its, its reduced representation. Okay. So one interesting surprise that we found was that um, is the following. So remember that I told you that this group of translations is not abelian because of the curvature. And this subgroup in general also is not abelian. But one surprise is that if you form the quotient, in many cases, in fact, for all, pulse, all prime numbers, if the system size is a prime number, then this group is abelian, okay? So why does that matter? Well, it matters because now we're back to a situation where uh, we're like in flat space. Mainly, namely that if the group is abelian, then it's like translations commute and then the momentum space on that becomes exact. In other words, in, in this case, if the periodic boundary conditions are such that this group is abelian, then we have a, an abelian block theorem, which tells us that all the states in the spectrum have the form that I told you earlier. Again, we can check this explicitly um, because we can perform exact diagonalization, just brute force solving our, our Hamiltonian on this cluster without worrying about any kind of, of, of possible on that. And then we can use this uh, hyperbolic band theory with a discretized wave vector. Okay, so, so the wave vector becomes discrete, just, just like in, in flat space. And we see that there is a exact match uh, in the spectrum. Okay, and so we've, we've captured really all the states in the spectrum. Now that's the first conclusion, which is that in, in many cases, you can define a class of boundary conditions where uh, this abelian on that uh, uh, is exact. However, there are uh, cases in which you can define a, uh, a choice of boundary conditions such that the group uh, is non-abelian. 
And now it becomes interesting because that means that not all the states will uh, actually obey this abelian theorem. So you will have a fraction of states that still obey this, this uh, description with these four crystal momenta, but there's other states that uh, uh, obey something a bit more exotic that we call a non-abelian blood theorem. Okay, so now what, now what this means is that instead of picking up a phase factor when you translate the wave function, you will pick up a matrix. Okay, so now you will have degeneracies, you will have degenerate multiplier states that will mix into each other under translations. Okay, so in other words, it's a bit like in quantum mechanics where you have degenerate multiplets, for example, you have degenerate P states or D states in the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, but now these multiplets are not due to rotation symmetry, they're due to translation symmetry, which is something that is completely impossible. Uh, it has no analog in, in flat space. Okay, it's really a consequence of the curvature. And so here's a specific example. We diagonalize uh, a, a small cluster with 25 unit cells, and we look at the spectrum and we see that there is blue states that obey this abelian block theorem. So they correspond to kind of crystal momenta, discretized crystal momenta uh, that just pick up a phase factor on their translation. But then we have these two-fold degenerate multiplets that will pick up like a, basically like a unitary matrix uh, of, of transformation under rotations. Okay, so just a very brief mathematical aside. So you might ask, well, we have these, these, uh, uh, these kind of Brillouin zones uh, that are four-dimensional or six-dimensional that describe the space of crystal momenta for these abelian states. What about these, uh, what about these uh, red uh, states here, these degenerate multiplets? What kind of space do they live in? What's the analog of the Brillouin zone for those higher dimensional representations? Well, it turns out that it has been studied in, in mathematics and they go by the name of character varieties. Um, they've also been studied in high energy physics. Uh, so they are uh, the flat space, uh, they are the space of flat connections on the Riemann surface. So if, if Chern Simons theory is something that you're familiar with, well, the, the classical phase space of Chern Simons theory before you quantize it is exactly that, that same space for not a BL in Chern Simons theory. And then uh, uh, algebraic geometers have also classified and looked at the geometry of these spaces. They view them as a as moduli space of vector bundles. And the reason that this is, is useful for physics is that using these algebraic geometry tools, they can kind of work out the geometry of what this Brillouin zone is. Okay, so for the, in the abelian case, it was just a torus, maybe a higher dimensional torus, but still a torus. And now for these non-abelian Brillouin zones, they're not tori in general. And so in the case of the octagonal lattice and the two-dimensional two reps, okay, so basically what is the space that these, these states here live in? Well, a mathematician have showed that it's, it's, it's a vibration. So it's something like a, a product of a torus times a CP3 manifold which, which is a six dimensional manifold, which is a bit like a sphere. It's a, it's a sphere like manifold that has curvature that is uh, uh, tensored with a, a torus. Okay, it's a kind of a more complicated space. In fact, this space is a 10 dimensional space um, in this case. All right, so, uh, so these non abelian block states, they kind of complicate the, the story a bit. So, how important are they in the spectrum? Um, so, uh, so, unfortunately, at this point, we don't have a complete parameterization of this space. We can't just plug in an ansatz and then compute the spectrum for these, for these states uh, uh, systematically, but we can do numerical experiments. So here's a series of, of such numerical experiments. So we've, we've computed the spectrum uh, 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 exactly just using, using numerics on clusters with several hundred sites. So these are the results that are plotted in gray. So it's, it's collapsing on the same curve, the data corresponding to all possible choice of periodic boundary conditions. In case you can see that there, is, there isn't such sensitivity actually to the choice of our condition. You get a relatively well-defined curve. And on top of this curve, we have plotted the result of only looking at the abelian states. Okay, that's the red curve. And you see that surprisingly, even if you ignore the non-abelian states, there's actually a fairly good agreement with the spectrum. So we don't have a good understanding yet why this is the case, but it seems like this, this sort of abelian approximation is actually pretty good. And here is actually is, is the spectrum of the the structure that was studying the, in the experiment, which uh, is, is of interest for, for that reason. Um, in case, actually, in this uh, more recent preprint, we've been interested in, in the fact that some of these lattices have flat bands. I won't go into the detail, but it turns out that using this band theory, we can completely understand the degeneracy of this flat band and also why certain lattices have, have a gap and some others have, have, have a band touching, which is something that was a bit of an open problem in, in the graph theory for hyperbolic lattices. So as the last, in the last few minutes, I'll just say a few words about something that I think is a really uh, exciting direction, which is now we have these hyperbolic lattices. We even have a band theory for them. 
And so if we think about band theory, well, of course, we think about topological band theory. So can we have topological insulator type physics on hyperbolic vertices? And so the answer is yes, there's been a recent work on this. And I'll just say a few words about this uh, third uh, paper here. Okay, so what they do is they uh, define a model on a hyperbolic version of the honeycomb lattice, which is this, uh, or this octagonal lattice, this A3 lattice that I've shown earlier. And they basically define the analog of the, the famous Haldane model of a churn insulator on this lattice. Okay, so it's a model that has near neighbor hopping, real hopping, but also uh, complex second neighbor hopping that breaks time reversal, opens a gap in the spectrum, and gives you a phase with non zero churn number. Okay, so here what they do is they, uh, they study this, this problem from three points of view. So they, they define this lattice. In this case, they have a lattice with, with a boundary, with edges, and they compute the spectrum or the density of states in three ways. So first, what they do is um, using this band theory that I've just uh, described. So this is the uh, direct curve. You see that there is various gaps in the spectrum as well as, as uh, gapless regions. Uh, next, what they do is they extract, uh, they perform exact diagonalization on this kind of flake with a boundary and they extract the bulk uh, density of states or at least an approximate version of it by computing the local density of states only on the innermost unit cell. Okay, so they compute the local density of states very far from the boundary. And uh, this is the, the blue curve. And then they compute the density of states, the local density of states near the boundary and that is the red mm -hmm. curve. So what's quite interesting is, is two things. First, this bulk calculation using the innermost unit cell matches pretty well with the, the, the hyperbolic band theory calculus. Okay, so the momentum space picture, yes, it's not exact, but it captures at least where the gaps are and where most of the structural weight is. And even more interestingly is the fact that in certain gaps, there is a large density of states on the boundary, whereas in some other gaps, there isn't. So what does that mean? Okay, could this possibly be due to edge states? And indeed they show that it's the case. So uh, when they place the chemical potential and let's say uh, one of these gaps with, with non-trivial uh, boundary density of states, they can set up a wave packet and then they see that the wave packet propagates in the chiral manner around the, around the flake. Um, they can even define a K-Millet uh, version of this model with sort of two copies of the Haldane model with opposite spin and they even add Rosbach type terms that ensure that the only symmetry you have is, is time reversal. You don't have spin conservation symmetry. But they, they find this helical uh, propagation, right? Where you have sort of counter propagating edge modes that are Kramer's partners. And they even add disorder and show that uh, uh, in the Haldane case, the edge states are robust to any kind of disorder. And for the Kane Millie case, then the edge states are robust in the presence of time reversal preserving disorder, but that they become localized if uh, you break time reversal uh, and you're in this topological phase. Um, and uh, so that's where the edge physics. Now, are there topological invariants that we can calculate? So here, what they do is they, uh, they calculate the so-called real space invariants that you can use if you have a system with disorder, for example, so that, that do not rely on a case-based description. So they calculate a real space turn number and also a real space k millet invariant. And they find that precisely when the gap has, you know, is filled in by edge states, uh, then the invariant is, is not trivial. It's not precisely quantized, but this is a finite size effect. So they see that as they make these regions bigger, in this kind of integration formula for the real space invariance, the integer gets closer and closer to the quantized value. So it's it's quite safe to say that it's it's really uh, an invariant. And again, the invariant is trivial whenever you're in this trivial gap. And what's uh, interesting from our point of view is that there seems there even to be a momentum space picture. Okay, so here it's interesting because the momentum space is four dimensional. So you cannot you cannot directly calculate a first turn number on this 4D space. You can calculate a second turn number which actually they do and they find it's is zero. However, the, you can calculate turn numbers in two dimensional planes in this 4D space, okay? And uh, so they can show that so due to point group symmetries, there's actually only two, not, uh, two independent turn numbers that they call C and CB computed in the one, K1, K2 plane and the K1, K3 planes. And they find it precisely when the physics is topological from the point of view of the edge physics and the real space invariance these momentum space also invariants are also non trivial because there really seems to be a sort of bulk edge correspondence, even at the level of momentum space, that really would be interesting to understand further. So, I'm basically done. So, before I, I summarize and conclude, I just want to thank my uh, collaborators. So, uh, the work on hyperbolic band theory was done with uh, Stephen Ryan, who is a, a mathematician at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, 
further developments on this, including this Bravelatis picture that was uh, studied with Igor Bircher, my colleague at Alberta, Alexey Gorskov and Alicia Kolar at the Joint Column Institute at the University of Maryland, and also Ronnie Tamale at the University of Würzburg in Germany. And the work on flat bands that I didn't really get a chance to talk about is done with Tomasz Zuszek at the Paul Scherer Institute and the University of Zurich in Switzerland. So to summarize, I think uh, hyperbolic lattices are, are an interesting kind of new platform in, in physics, uh, in synthetic materials to uh, look at, uh, for example, simulation of curved space and also uh, um, produce exotic band structures. I've argued that uh, non-Euclidean periodicity uh, is, is something that is worth looking at. It's an analog of translations in, in curved space and it allows for block physics, either of the sort of conventional type abelian physics, even though the momentum space is higher dimensional, and also for something even more exotic, which is non-abelian block states. And finally, there's interesting phenomenology to, to be studied. So we've looked at flat bands and topological bands have been studied, and there might be many more things to explore as well. In terms of uh, future work, from the theory side, we'd like to understand why this abelian uh, theory seems to do a good job of approximating the full spectrum. So remember this comparison between this red curve and this gray spectrum. It's not clear to us why this works so well. Uh, these non-abelian block states, what we can define them, we, they're there. What's their physics? Can we probe them and so on? That's that's a question. And also, uh, uh, how do we relate these momentum space invariants to the real space invariants in these topological hyperbolic models? It would be really interesting to see whether we can rigorously establish that these things are connected in some way. From the experimental uh, standpoint, periodic boundary conditions is actually something we might be able to engineer uh, in, in practice because these are synthetic systems. And especially in the case of the electrical circuit network, you can really pass wires across the system. And then you can maybe really directly engineer these block states and, and probe them and show at least as a proof of principle that they do exist. Uh, uh, flat bands, well, I've shown this CQD experiment, which is a Kagan lattice that has flat bands. So already there is a demonstration of that. Um, and topological bands, for sure, can we engineer these the topological insulators the C edge propagation and so on would be really interesting. And uh, there's other connection that I didn't have a chance to talk about, but this connects to things like holography, the DSCFT, quantum information, and so on. So I think there's a lot of interesting connections to other fields of, of physics and mathematics and information theory. So with that, I would like to thank the, the funding agencies that made this work possible, and also all of you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Joseph, for this very nice talk. Uh, it clearly seems the start of something very fundamental and important um, kind of band theory in this um, hyperbolic geometry and hyperbolic lattices. Um, there's definitely a lot of connections to um, metamaterials and uh, circuit QED and a lot of optics as well in there, uh, which is super interesting. So what we would like to do is... Um, end the streaming part of the talk so that we can begin our discussions. Uh, I want to thank everyone who is here um, and also a very special thank you to Joseph once again for such a beautiful talk. Uh, we're completely new to the area, but um, it seems uh, super interesting and we have a lot of questions for discussion uh, going ahead. So thank you everyone.